Hi, my name is Rachel Harris and I'm a trainee advanced clinical practitioner working within the hospital out of our service and currently undertaking a non-medical prescribing module. I've produced this short presentation in order to discuss the use of antibiotics in neurosepsis. But before I begin, I must stress that in a must stress that in accordance to the Nursing and Midwifery Code of Conduct, all named personnel will be held strictly confidential and therefore for the purpose of this work, my patient will be known as Mr Smith. I'll begin by discussing the Royal Pharmaceutical Society RPS framework, which was published in collaboration with all medical and allied health professional bodies across the UK. This set out the expected competencies of all prescribers to ensure safe prescribing. It has been noted that although the advancement of non-medical prescribing is beneficial, it to healthcare, it is not without its risks. Prescribing errors are common, and the RPS states that prescribing is going to get much more complex given the ageing population and that polypharmacy is becoming the norm. Therefore, this framework is designed to help highlight, then address and reduce the risks of errors and ensure safety in prescribing decisions. So I was working on a shift on the acute medical unit alongside my DMP, who's an acute medical consultant, when I clerked in Mr Smith. A full history and assessment was taken and can be seen on this slide. Mr Smith was diagnosed with urosepsis. Given the history obtained and his clinical picture, there was enough suspicion of urosepsis to treat for this in accordance to NICE 2017, who had stated that suspicion of an effective cause is all that is required, whereas Draeger et al. 2015 contradicts this by saying urosepsis cannot truly be diagnosed until urinalysis is reported. Listed on the slide are the key signs and symptoms and risk factors for urosepsis. Mr Smith had all the signs and had three of the risk factors. Other factors prompting this diagnosis was the raised CRP of 438. Vincent and Buma in 2013 found a serum CRP has a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 86.1. However, when combined with a temperature of 38.2, like Mr Smith's, this specificity for infective diagnosis is increased to 100%. For it was clear that Mr Smith had an infection and looking at the sepsis red flags from 2020, which include a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and a respiratory rate of above 25, it was clear he had sepsis. In agreement to the National Sepsis Organisation in 2020, IV antibiotics were prescribed as part of the plan noted on the slide. IV piperacillin and tazobactam, also known as tazacin, was prescribed in accordance with these guidelines, and this will now form the basis of my presentation. So let us consider the options. So considering both pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods of disease treatment is paramount in any prescribing decision and makes up competency two in the RPS framework. This slide considers some of the risks involved in both and the ultimate decision is often based around benefit versus risk for the patient. There is lack of evidence surrounding non-pharmacological research in the treatment to urosepsis or sepsis of any kind. However, there is mass evidence supporting pharmacological intervention with the use of antibiotics. As prescribers, we are taught that the beneficial effects of medications must be weighed against the potential adverse drug reactions and interactions. And HE et al. in 2010 stated tazacin is often well tolerated and adverse drug reactions are usually mild to moderate, rarely requiring discontinuation of treatment. However, it is important to highlight these possible risks and be aware of how this may impact on the patient as well as the healthcare system, for example, extended length of inpatient stay. Calra and Rizada in 2009, found that administration of an effective antibiotic within one hour was associated with a survival risk of 80%. For each delayed hour, this rate decreased by 8%. Leading the argument is the Sepsis Organisation in 2020, with their Sepsis 6 or Buffalo campaign, teaching that antibiotics are required as soon as possible. Given that the risks of treating with antibiotics were minimal compared to that of non-pharmacological, and taking into account Mr Smith's allergies, status which was no known drug allergies, and his renal function, which showed a creatinine clearance of 38, it was decided to treat him with antibiotics, which brought around the next decision, what kind of antibiotic? So the NICE guidelines for 2020 state for any sepsis given intravenous broad-spectrum antibiotic. And similarly, the low cultures guidelines from 2020 advises intravenous tazacin, a broad-spectrum antibiotic, 4.5 grams three times a day for sepsis of any origin, with a no penicillin allergy. There is no evidence supporting these guidelines. However, enough research is available as to why this antibiotic is effective. The local trust guidelines have been written by the local antimicrobial team in conjunction with the urology specialist. And McNulty and Scatmani in 2019 state that it is crucial that local guidance is followed as inappropriate antibiotic management may lead to increased antibiotic organism resistance. 
Laura Pratchett et al. in 2016 supports the decision in broad spectrum antibiotics in their study. They found that out of 78 cases, 58.9% of these grew E. coli, Staph aureus, and Staph pneumoni in their blood cultures, so a mixture of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. From these, 55 cases were checked with appropriate broad spectrum antibiotics, and 31 survived, as opposed to the nine who survived from narrow spectrum out of 23 cases. Dix in 2003 explains that broad spectrum antibiotics can kill both gram positive and gram negative bacteria, whereas narrow spectrum can only focus on one. And Makowska et al. in 2018 stated broad spectrum antibiotics, including piperacillin and tazobactam, should be administered intravenously during the first hour after sepsis diagnosis. There is little evidence to support narrow spectrum antibiotics in the treatment to urosepsis. Ayashi et al. 2010 however found that although tazacin is an effective antibiotic, prompt de-escalation prompt de -escalation to narrow spectrum antibiotics should occur to prevent any antibiotic collateral damage or resistance. However, as an NMP, I am accountable to my national interest guidelines and the NICE guidelines for sepsis in 2019 stated the clinical benefits of having intravenous broad spectrum antibiotics outweigh any risks associated with the possibility of antimicrobial resistance. Given the patient's age, how acutely unwell he was, and that he had the potential to deteriorate rapidly if not treated or treated with the wrong antibiotics, IV tazacin 4.5 grams three times a day was prescribed for five days, but with a plan to be reviewed once urine analysis and blood cultures were back from the labs. But what exactly is taz tazacin, and how does it work at combating sepsis? So the Pharmacology Education Project states that pharmacology is important for healthcare professionals. It is a scientific discipline underpinning the rational prescribing of medications to alleviate symptoms, treat illness and prevent future disease. Pharmacodynamics is the branch of pharmacology concerned with the effect of the drugs on the body. So antibiotics can work in two ways as listed here. Tazacin is, a, is piperacillin and combined with tazobactam. Piperacillin is a broad spectrum semi-synthetic penicillin which works by inhibiting both the septum and cell wall synthesis. Tazobactam is an inhibitor of beta-lactamases, which commonly cause resistance to penicillins and cephalosporins. This means that when used together, more types of bacteria are killed. And tazacin therefore works as a bactericidal antibiotic, so it works by killing the bacteria through inhibiting cell wall synthesis. Tazacin is only available in intravenous form and is effectively used in adults and adolescents to treat many different bacterial infections, including urinary tract infections, reinforcing our prescribing decision. Pharmacokinetics can be described as what the body does to the drug and is broken down into ADME. A is for absorption and the rate of absorption and the amount of drug absorbed is very much dependent on the route of administration. The amount of drug absorbed is known as bioavailability. Tazacin is only available to administer parentally and therefore intravenously and is usually administered over a 30 minute infusion. Intravenous route has the highest bioavailability rate of administrative routes, and this is at 100% because the drug is administered straight into the systemic circulation. D is for distribution, and both piperacillin and tazobactam are approximately 30% bound to plasma proteins. The protein binding to either of these is unaffected by the presence of the other component. Tazacin is widely distributed in the body tissues and fluid, including the intestinal mucosa, the gallbladder, the liver and the bone. And the mean tissue concentrations are generally 50 to 100% of those in plasma. However, this may differ between, differ between different tissues, helping make tazacin an effective antibiotic for a wide range of infections within the body, reassuring me that this was an appropriate prescription for Mr Smith. M is for metabolism, and as Mr. Smith's tazacin was administered intravenously, it bypassed the first pass effect, which is where the concentration of a drug is reduced greatly before it reaches the systemic circulation. This occurs in drugs administered orally because they have to pass through the hepatic system and are, off and are often metabolized in the liver by enzymes such as cytochromes P450, making them largely inactive, hence the lower bioavailability of oral drugs compared to intravenous ones. Jung and Plotka in 2001 found that IV tazacin was hepatically metabolized, meaning it will pass through the hepatic portal system, as mentioned earlier, to become metabolized. This then brings us around to E, which is for elimination. And like most drugs, piperacillin and tazobactam are eliminated via the renal system. Piperacillin is excreted rapidly as an unchanged substance, with approximately 68% of the administered dose appearing in the urine 
and tazobactam and its M1 metabolite are primarily, primarily renally excreted, with around 80% of the administered dose eliminated as an unchanged drug. The remaining of the drug is eliminated as a single metabolite. However, some of the tazacin can also be excreted into bile, likely during the enterohepatic cycle, enterohepatic cycle. So why is it important to know this? So because tazacin is largely renally excreted, Hei et al. in 2010 found that compared with patients with a normal renal function, those with a reduced creatinine clearance of 10 to 30 mL a minute, only 35% of the administered dose was renally excreted. Mr. Smith's renal function was normal, however, McGavick in 2016 found that by the age of 70, renal function is only 50% of its youthful maximum in most people, meaning the drug excreting capacity can be reduced by 50%. Half-life of a drug is the time taken for a drug concentration in the blood to fall by half, and is important as, like with elimination, the half-life of tazacin increases with a decrease in renal function. Therefore, the half-life of the drug in the elderly population, like Mr Smith, can be approximately 40 to 50% longer than that of a younger person. The half-life of tazacin is, in, is within the range of 0.7 to 1.2 hours, therefore relatively fast, meaning regular dosing can often be given within 24-hour period. Adjusted dosing can be seen on the BNF and here on this slide. Within pharmacology, it's also important to look at the patient's drug history to see for any interactions which occurs when the administration of one drug alters the clinical effects of another. During this case study, I checked that on the BNF I found no interactions between Mr. Smith's regular medications and Tazacin. So according to the NICE guidelines in 2018, NMPs are accountable for the assessment of diagnosed and undiagnosed patients and are responsible for the decision making in relation to a management plan, prescribing, not prescribing and making changes to current medications. Since 2001, a new approach to accountability has been introduced by Coalfield, which identifies four pillars of accountability. Pillar one is professional accountability and we are each accountable to our governing bodies. I have a nursing background, therefore I am accountable to the NMC Code of Conduct and must always practice within these four domains, as well as being accountable to the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and the national and local policies as stated below. Pillars two, three and four are the ethical accountability, legal accountability and employment accountability, which can be seen on the next slide. By law, accountability is implied by the signing of a person's contract, meaning nurses are covered by their employ employer's vicarious liability. However, it is vital to remember that professional litigation can often follow employment dis disputes as each registrant is ultimately responsible for their own actions. So how can we uphold our accountability? So LOVA in 2010 states that accountability is upheld through several types of law as well as ethics. This includes statutory law, which includes the Medicines Act in 1968 and the Misuse of Drugs Act in 1971, which has been further adapted in 2011 to adapt to the evolving role of the NMP and allowing them to prescribe control drugs for treatment, but not for addiction. Other laws we are accountable to include civil law, criminal law and contract law. All to, um, being accountable to these laws emphasises the importance of adhering to the governing body, code of conduct and local and national guidelines to ensure high patient care is delivered, something which all healthcare professionals should strive to achieve, strive to provide. The NMC states that as an independent nurse prescriber, it is essential to ensure all decisions are made ethically and accepting your own accountability. Both Champion Childress highlighted the four key principles to biomedical ethics. And these principles were adhered to throughout my case study. I ensured Mr Smith was in control of the decisions made and all decisions were discussed with him and shown he fully understood his condition and the treatment options and consent was gained. This was based on Mr Smith having capacity. On assessment of a patient without capacity, NMP should ensure they work within the Human Rights Act and the Mental Capacity Act to ensure we treat them ethically as they deserve. I also ensured that all decisions were made in Mr Smith's best interest with most up-to-date knowledge through CPD and evidence-based practice and ensured that harm to Mr Smith was reduced as much as possible. And this is evidence when addressing the side effects and the adverse drug reactions from the antibiotic, but weighing that up with the risk of not giving him the appropriate treatment. So finally, the RCN in 2018 stated that CPD is vital for nursing staff to maintain and develop the skills they need to deliver high quality care. The, this case study and module help, has helped my CPD greatly, working alongside my consultant and other members of the team, I was able to gain insight and knowledge and skills from other professionals 
with a wide variety of experience which I can transfer and build upon throughout my training and career. Here are some CPD opportunities throughout my career. Thank you for listening.